Chapter twenty three of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Houston, Texas, June two thousand eight. Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Written by herself. By Harriet Jacobs. Written under the pseudonym Linda Brent. Chapter twenty three. STILL IN PRISON When spring returned, and I took in the little patch of green the aperture commanded, I asked myself how many more summers and winters I must be condemned to spend thus. I longed to draw in a plentiful draught of fresh air, to stretch my cramped limbs, to have room to stand erect, to feel the earth under my feet again. My relatives were constantly on the lookout for a chance of escape but none offered that seemed practicable, and even tolerably safe. The hot summer came again, and made the turpentine drop from the thin roof over my head. During the long nights I was restless for want of air, and I had no room to toss and turn. There was but one compensation. The atmosphere was so stifled that even mosquitoes would not condescend to buzz in it. With all my detestation of Dr. Flint, I could hardly wish him a worse punishment, either in this world or that which is to come, than to suffer what I suffered in one single summer. Yet the laws allowed him to be out in the free air, while I, guiltless of crime, was pent up here, as the only means of avoiding the cruelties the laws allowed him to inflict upon me. I don't know what kept life within me. Again and again I thought I should die before long. But I saw the leaves of another autumn whirl through the air, and felt the touch of another winter. In summer the most terrible thunderstorms were acceptable, for the rain came through the roof, and I rolled up my bed that it might cool the hot boards under it. Later in the season storms sometimes wet my clothes through and through, and that was not comfortable when the air grew chilly. Moderate storms I could keep out by filling the chinks with oakum. But, uncomfortable as my situation was, I had glimpses of things out of doors which made me thankful for my wretched hiding-place. One day I saw a slave pass our gate, muttering, "'It's his own, and he can kill it if he will.' My grandmother told me that woman's history. Her mistress had that day seen her baby for the first time, and in the lineaments of its fair face she saw a likeness to her husband. She turned the bondwoman and her child out of doors, and forbade her ever to return. The slave went to her master and told him what had happened. He promised to talk with her mistress and make it all right. The next day she and her baby were sold to a Georgia trader. Another time I saw a woman rush wildly by, pursued by two men. She was a slave, the wet nurse of her mistress's children. For some trifling offence her mistress ordered her to be stripped and whipped. To escape the degradation and the torture, she rushed to the river, jumped in, and ended her wrongs in death. Senator Brown of Mississippi could not be ignorant of many such facts as these, for they are of frequent occurrence in every southern state. Yet he stood up in the Congress of the United States, and declared that slavery was a great moral, social, and political blessing, a blessing to the master, and a blessing to the slave. I suffered much more during the second winter than I did during the first. My limbs were benumbed by inaction, and the cold filled them with cramp. I had a very painful sensation of coldness in my head. Even my face and tongue stiffened, and I lost the power of speech. Of course it was impossible under the circumstances to summon any physician. My brother William came and did all he could for me. Uncle Philip also watched tenderly over me, and poor grandmother crept up and down to inquire whether there were any signs of returning life. I was restored to consciousness by the dashing of cold water in my face, and found myself leaning against my brother's arm while he bent over me with streaming eyes. He afterwards told me he thought I was dying, for I had been in an unconscious state sixteen hours. I next became delirious, and was in great danger of betraying myself and my friends. To prevent this, they stupefied me with drugs. I remained in bed six weeks, weary in body and sick at heart. How to get medical advice was the question. William finally went to a Thompsonian doctor, and described himself as having all my pains and aches. He returned with herbs, roots, and ointment. 
He was especially charged to rub on the ointment by a fire. But how could a fire be made in my little den? Charcoal in a furnace was tried, but there was no outlet for the gas, and it nearly cost me my life. Afterwards coals, already kindled, were brought up in an iron pan, and placed on bricks. I was so weak, and it was so long since I had enjoyed the warmth of a fire, that those few coals actually made me weep. I think the medicines did me some good, but my recovery was very slow. Dark thoughts passed through my mind as I lay there day after day. I tried to be thankful for my little cell, dismal as it was, and even to love it, as part of the price I had paid for the redemption of my children. Sometimes I thought God was a compassionate Father, who would forgive my sins for the sake of my sufferings. At other times, it seemed to me there was no justice or mercy in the divine government. I asked why the curse of slavery was permitted to exist, and why I had been so persecuted and wronged from youth upward. These things took the shape of mystery, which is to this day not so clear to my soul as I trust it will be hereafter. In the midst of my illness, Grandmother broke down under the weight and anxiety and toil. The idea of losing her, who had always been my best friend and a mother to my children, was the sorest trial I had yet had. Oh, how earnestly I prayed that she might recover! How hard it seemed that I could not tend upon her, who had so long and so tenderly watched over me! One day the screams of a child nerved me with strength to crawl to my peeping-hole, and I saw my son covered with blood. A fierce dog, usually kept chained, had seized and bitten him. A doctor was sent for, and I heard the groans and screams of my child while the wounds were being sewed up. Oh, what torture to a mother's heart to listen to this and be unable to go to him! But childhood is like a day in spring, alternately shower and sunshine. Before night Benny was bright and lively, threatening the destruction of the dog, and great was his delight when the doctor told him the next day that the dog had bitten another boy, and been shot. Benny recovered from his wounds, but it was long before he could walk. When my grandmother's illness became known, many ladies, who were her customers, called to bring her some little comforts, and to inquire whether she had everything she wanted. Aunt Nancy one night asked permission to watch with her sick mother, and Mrs. Flint replied, "'I don't see any need of your going. I can't spare you.' But when she found other ladies in the neighbourhood were so attentive, not wishing to be outdone in Christian charity, she also sallied forth, in magnificent condescension, and stood by the bedside of her who had loved her in her infancy, and who had been repaid by such grievous wrongs. She seemed surprised to find her so ill and scolded Uncle Philip for not sending for Dr. Flint. She herself sent for him immediately, and he came. Secure as I was in my retreat, I should have been terrified if I had known he was so near me. He pronounced my grandmother in a very critical situation, and said if her attending physician wished it, he would visit her. Nobody wished to have him coming to the house at all hours, and we were not disposed to give him a chance to make out a long bill. As Mrs. Flint went out, Sally told her the reason Benny was lame was that a dog had bitten him. "'I'm glad of it,' replied she. "'I wish he had killed him. It would be good news to send to his mother. Her day will come. The dogs will grab her yet.' With these Christian words she and her husband departed, and to my great satisfaction returned no more. I learned from Uncle Philip, with feelings of unspeakable joy and gratitude, that the crisis was past and Grandmother would live. I could now say from my heart, God is merciful. He has spared me the anguish of feeling that I caused her death. End of chapter 23